Good. Um, so thanks everyone for being here today. The reason we're recording this is because we don't want you to have to furiously take notes. So any of the information uh, is certainly freely available to anyone in the group. Um, and as well as it's available to you, it's also available to any researchers in the field. Uh, just to be very clear, anything that I'm talking about today is de-identified. So in other words, no one is individually identified by who your son or daughter might be, um, but it is aggregated information. Um, and again, if there's anyone that you happen to come across in terms of researchers who are interested in working on CHAMP1, we very much want to drive that forward research or that, that research forward. Next slide, Lindsay. So, I'm going to give you a little bit of background that I think you've probably already learned from your individual doctors, but I just want to make sure at the beginning everyone's in the same page. Um, everyone on this call is united because there's someone we care about with CHAMP1. Um, I'll be at the family meeting at Florida, and I hope I'll actually get the chance to meet several of you. Um, so really looking forward to that, and thank you, Jeff, for all your efforts to get that together. Um, we're united today because CHAMP1 is a particular, it's one of 20,000 genes that we have in our genome. And for each of your children, uh, I think it's everyone I heard was a parent. So I think for each of your children, they have a particular change, genetic change in the CHAMP1 gene. It's actually um, very small in the sense that out of our three billion alphabet letters, it's oftentimes just one or two letters that are changed, but it's had a big effect. Uh, within this, one of the reasons I put this slide in is because our genes are, are housed, the structures they're housed in are called chromosomes. Um, most of us have 46 of those chromosomes. They're stick-like figures that contain our genes. And in fact, um, to be able to get the correct amount of genetic information in each of our genes or each of our cells when our cells divide, um, those chromosome actually have to separate appropriately. And the problem with CHAMP1 is actually a problem with that structure of how the chromosomes sometimes um, separate and separate appropriately when cells are dividing. And that's the fundamental issue or problem in terms of CHAMP1. Next slide. Um, when we think about genetic information, it comes from our mother and our father. And in fact, about half of the information comes from each one of them. Uh, for everyone, at least to my knowledge, who has a CHAMP1 diagnosis so far, um, the change or the issue is something that happened new in the child. And so I've shown this here by showing a picture of a family with a father and a mother, and then the little boy on the left um, has a new genetic change. So for most people, as I said, this is something that was not inherited from either the mother or the father, so it wasn't passed down from either parent, but it is genetic, so it is coded in the genes. And I know that sounds a little bit odd because a lot of people think about genes and heredity and inheritance as all the same thing. And they're very, very similar, but they're not exactly the same. Um, just to know that although your children are very special, very special to me in particular, um, they're not so special in the sense that all of us have new genetic changes. So what I mean by that, and I can say, as I said, I have two sons, and we've actually looked at this even in them. Um, there are about 100 to 150 spots out of those 3 billion letters that when we have a child are different in the child from either one of those parents. So new, or sometimes we call them de novo genetic changes. So that in and of itself isn't special for anyone on this line. What is special is where those de novo or new genetic changes happen to land. And as we're going to uh, see in the next few slides, um, it's happened to land in CHAMP1 for your sons and daughters. And so it happened to land in a place that was very important in terms of how, in particular, the brain forms and functions. Um, and that's why your children have the challenges that they do. Um, there wasn't anything that you did that caused this. And so I know personally, I, I take care of a lot of patients, um, not only with CHAMP1, but with other things. And I find that many times parents are asking this question of why, why me, why did it happen? How did it happen? Um, just to allay some of perhaps your concerns, there wasn't anything that you as mothers did or didn't do during the pregnancy. It wasn't if you had a glass of wine before you realized you were pregnancy or if you missed a day of prenatal vitamins. Um, it wasn't anything that you had any control over. And uh, certainly in terms of likelihood of happening again to other people in the family, um, there really is not a, a, long, a, a very high likelihood of it happening. 
Um, for couples on this line, if you do have a child with a CHAMP1 change, there is about a 1% chance that it could happen if you had other children. And I, I do hear that some of you probably have older children and that might not be an issue. Um, for those of you that have other children without CHAMP1, when they grow up to have their children, their own families, they will not have a risk of passing that down. So it's really just an issue for your child with CHAMP1. And then if you as parents have another child, there's about a 1% chance that it could happen again, but it's not a very high chance. And during the question and answer period, if people have specific questions, I'll drill down further. But for now, um, Lindsay will just go on and talk about what we know about CHAMP1 to date. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot one more uh, slide on this. So. Um, as, as you all have had uh, genetic testing, many of you have had genetic testing that looked at blood from your child, in some cases maybe another sample like saliva. Um, with that, we know it's really in all the cells throughout your child's body. But we don't know, based on those genetic tests, whether it came from the mother, from the sperm, or from the egg, or if it came shortly after conception. We can't tell that from the blood test. Um, but as I said, it's not very likely to happen again, only about 1%. Next slide. So the information I'm gonna tell you about today, I will say that um, number one, thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for all the families who registered on Simon's VIP, for those of you who are kind enough to send in your genetic test reports to speak with um, either Catherine or Ashley, the two genetic counselors who work with me on aggregating the data. Um, this is really thanks to you um, and thank you for your generosity in, in terms of providing that to the community. Uh, I do want to say that these are early days, so when I think about anyone who's participated in Simon's VIP or anyone to my knowledge who's in the published medical literature, we're still at very small numbers. So uh, by all counts, certainly less than 50, um, and these are early days. That's not to say that that's those are the only people with CHAMP1 that are out there. I'm absolutely convinced there are many, many more people with CHAMP1 out there. They simply haven't had genetic testing, or at least not the right genetic testing, to identify the diagnosis. And so one of the things I also spend a lot of time doing is making sure that individuals can get access to the genetic testing they need, uh, because we really need to learn more from more people to be able to get accurate predictions about what the future holds for our kids and how we can better support them. So to give you a sense of this, the data I'm going to tell you about today is based really only on eight individuals. So to me, it's great that we have eight individuals, um, but it's small numbers, and I'm sure there, there's much more that we have to learn. Um, many of you have registered uh, on Simon's VIP, but for all of you that have registered, you haven't made it through the entire process to do what we call the medical history interview and to do the Vineland assessment. And so if you haven't made it through the steps in terms of first consenting, so actually providing written permission to be part of the research study and providing your laboratory port report, if we haven't reviewed that to make sure CHAMP1 is the correct diagnosis, um, then, then you haven't been part of these studies. And then the next step, as I said, is to talk to the genetic counselors by phone, and uh, we're certainly happy to take feedback in terms of what's working or not working from that process. Um, but as I said, the people that I'm gonna be talking about are ranging in age from two to 15, and are half boys and half girls. One of the points that I wanna make is that our oldest participant that I'm gonna be talking about today is only 15 years old. And one of the things that I am uh, want more data on for you are individuals, for instance, who are adults. Because I think the thing that I continue to be concerned about are what are the long-term health issues and uh, just everyday life issues that we're going to have to deal with. And if I know what the outcome, you know, long term is going to be, it, it gives me a better sense of what we need to be careful about and what we need to plan as the children are growing up. So that's, it's a, it's going to be a tall order to fill. I'll warn you because many adults um, aren't getting genetic diagnostic testing, but it is one of the gaps that we need to fill in our knowledge. Next slide. So this is a um, compilation of the 12 individuals in the community who have provided their genetic test reports. Um, on the left looks like gobbledygook, I'm sure, but it's the code that we use to describe the exact genetic change that we see in CHAMP1 um, for the individuals, the 12 individuals who are registered. What you'll see on the right are the number of individuals with each different type of genetic change. And one of the things you'll see from that is that many individuals are the only ones on the 
specialist with that particular type of change. There are three individuals who happen to have this arginine 497 uh, stop, and then two individuals on the last row that have the histidine 760 arginine. Um, and although it might feel like, well, you know, I feel lonely or, you know, how am I going to, with so many different uh, genetic changes, um, are they all the same? Are all of our kids the same? Uh, I want to give you a little bit of technical understanding. Um, for the ones on the left, the variants on the left that have that little star or that little asterisk, what it means is that the CHAMP1 protein starts to be made and then it stops at that exact position that's indicated. So whether it's 181 or 334 or 497, um, the entire protein is not made. And I won't go into all of the details, but we think that causes um, one copy of the gene not to function at all. So we use the term loss of function. Um, in all of those cases, there's still one very good copy of the CHAMP1 gene that's working, and it's trying to work overtime even, but it's trying to do its job. But the manifestations of the problems are results of that other copy of the CHAMP1 gene not working. All of those mutations or all of those genetic variations with that star, we think act essentially in the same way. That is that there's not enough of that CHAMP1 protein being made and that one copy is not showing up to work. It's, it's not functional. So even though there are many different places where it occurs, I aggregate them or I put them together in my head as basically being one class. And so actually the community is, is to me, relatively similar. The one difference is that last line, the histidine 760 arginine, for any of you where your children have that particular change, that looks to be quite unique and potentially could be quite important. And so when we get down to Florida, I think we're going to be talking much more about research opportunities and how to move things forward. Um, it will be very important for families if your child has that last genetic change to make sure you're represented because you could actually provide some very important insight into how things are working for the CHAMP1 gene. Next slide. So with that, now I'm going to switch gears and talk about, as I said, the eight individuals uh, who have provided medical information to us. Next slide. Um, so with this, I'm going to start in terms of what is um, most similar, and I think everyone on this line, and I know you guys have been talking to each other quite a bit, um, I think all of you appreciate, and this is not going to be any surprise. What seems to be uh, probably the greatest challenge and the one with the, the greatest similarity between families are problems with the brain function, um, how it works on a day-to-day -day basis. And depending on your, the age of your child, they may have been labeled with the diagnosis of developmental delay or global developmental delay or intellectual disability. And as pediatricians, um, that diagnosis, the words for that change a little bit depending on the age of the child. Uh, but it's similar in the sense that when the children, as you'll see, when the children were learning to walk or talk or sign or, um, you know, do all of those, those milestones, we call them, or all of those achievements in, in early childhood, they've been later than uh, other children or, or their siblings. In particular, when we get to specific areas, speech delay um, has been a challenge and, and speaking has been a challenge. Uh, but I do think, personally, my observation is that children understand a lot more than they're able to express. And so one of the things um, that I'll encourage each of you to do is work very hard with your therapist, your speech therapist, and your other therapist to think and find about um, other alternative communication methods. So whether it's signing, whether it's communication devices, whether it's picture boards. There are lots of different things that are possible, um, but I encourage you because, as I said, I do think the children understand and know a lot about what's going on. Um, they have difficulty in terms of the speech and the words themselves, but, but it's not to say that they can't express themselves. For some of the older children, we've noticed issues also in terms of attention, so being able to focus, being able to stay uh, attuned and be able to attend to things that can be an issue. They can be distractible. Um, and one of the child, one of the children had a diagnosis of a learning disability. But again, all of these, I think, related to the same fundamental challenge in terms of the brain being able to function and keep up um, and to learn. Next slide, Lindsay. So very specifically, um, one of the things I'll warn you about, again, is to remember that the children uh, are ranged quite a bit in age from 2 to 15, as I said. 
Uh, not all of the children have yet attained the ability to walk or talk. So this represents only those children who were able to uh, at least talk or have a word approximation or take their first steps. Um, and you can see along the left the age at what the children were able to uh, say a first word, again, for those five children who were able to express a word. And then on the right, um, again, shown along the y-axis there, the age and years at which they were able to take their first steps. So you can see that for the children who have started walking, um, they've started taking their first steps between the ages of two and three. And then for some of the children, uh, again, who have been starting to talk, um, they've been doing that everywhere from one to about five and a half years old. Um, not all of the children have yet attained those milestones. So some of them, they're still coming along. Uh, and some of the children, as I said, uh, you know, are still young. And so they, they just may not have gotten to that point yet. Next slide. I'm going to switch gears now to talk about the medical issues or things more related to health, and I'm going to just do them chronologically, so starting at the beginning from um, literally when they were first born. So many of the children had some issues right around the time they were born. Uh, two of the, the eight children were admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit, and that's what I'm showing on that bottom line. Um, what I would describe is none of them were um, sort of continued problems, uh, continued issues, but they were the sort of what first brought them to attention, problems with breathing, uh, problems in terms of a low heart rate, um, something that's very common actually is requiring or having jaundice or being a little yellow and requiring maybe some lights to help clear up that yellow. Um, but these were things that, that were first obvious. Next slide. Um, those were often obvious to the doctors, but many of the things you all as parents noticed, again, in your newborns was that they were, and, and some of you actually told us this specifically, if you had other children, they seem to be a bit different. Um, their tone may have been lower. They may have had some issues feeding, being able to latch on and to uh, suck and swallow and coordinate um, eating early on may have been an issue. They may have been a little bit more sleepy, more lethargic is the word we sometimes use, or fussier. Um, but many of you noticed that something was different. Um, it may not have been something that was diagnosed by a medical person, but you all as parents realized something was different. Next slide. Um, one of the, I'm going to focus and bring up issues that uh, I think your doctors have been taking care of, um, but I want to focus on things that might be actionable, that there might be something that you need to pay attention to, keep an eye on, and work with your doctors. Um, and again, for any of you that want this information to take to your doctors, I'm glad to send Jeff a copy of the slide so that you can just take a print out of these. You can certainly refer them to the recording that we're doing. Uh, but the point is that many of your doctors don't have experience with CHAMP-1. You're really the, the specialist in this case. And so we wanted to arm you with some data, some information for your doctors. Um, so as your children are having challenges learning, we want to make sure that all the channels of communication coming into their brain are working as well as possible. So we want to make sure that we take away any barriers possible um, for the senses to work properly. And so I'm going to go through a couple of these, but the eyes are certainly the way that we see the world, literally. And so we need to be able to make sure that they can see the world as clearly and as much in focus as possible. And we do know that the children are having more than the average problems with their eyes. And so it's a really important thing is to make sure that they're being seen by a pediatric ophthalmologist um, and that they're this can be particularly problematic for children who are nonverbal or can't communicate effectively. Uh, so you need someone, hopefully, who's a really, as I said, experienced pediatric ophthalmologist. Um, some of these things you can see or the eye doctor can see just by looking at the eyes. So they can see things like strabismus or a lazy eye. Again, if you're noticing this, bring it to the attention of your doctor. They can notice things like nystagmus or the eyes sort of uh, going back and forth. Um, it's a motion that goes horizontally back and forth of the eyes. Those are things that if you see them, again, bring them to the attention of your doctor. 
Some of the other issues like being farsighted or having an astigmatism are more difficult to tell, especially as I said, in a child who may be uh, difficult to examine, either may not be able to read an eye chart and talk about you know, what letters they're seeing, um, or that may have difficulty being able to sit still, or maybe you know, quite honestly, um, afraid by what seems you know, new and different to them. Um, with this, though, we do appreciate that a majority of the children are having problems seeing at a distance. That's what farsighted means. So they're having trouble seeing at a distance. Um, and so it's important to correct that if it needs glasses to be able to correct it. But again, to be able to see the world accurately, it helps in terms of decreasing anxiety because they can just see what's going on. And again, it increases their, their learning ability. Next slide. I will say, as uh, uh, we're talking about this, that from a neurological point of view and from a health point of view, in general, I would describe this as being a stable condition as opposed to a degenerative condition. So all the evidence I have so far, and any fa families, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but that the children continue to make forward progress. It's slower than, than their siblings or than their peers, but they continue to make forward progress. And I have not to date seen anyone that has regressed or fallen backwards or lost skills that they really permanently had. Not to say that it doesn't take longer for them to achieve those skills, uh, but it has not been a degenerative process. So the things that we've seen that some of your doctors may have noticed is low muscle tone. Um, they're looser. Uh, they also can get tired more easily as a result of that. Um, when the pediatrician measures or the neurologist measures the head size, we certainly have noticed that not everyone, but there's a tendency to have a smaller head size. Um, and that's actually true of many of these types of chromosomal disorders that we see. Um, that is that when, when for other conditions that are associated with the chromosomes being able to normally separate and divide, um, microcephaly is something we've seen in other other similar conditions. They can have trouble with coordination, so they can appear to be clumsy, they can appear to have difficulty uh, in terms of smooth motor movements or smooth movements of their body, and it takes them a lot longer to be able to learn motor movements. So some people will talk about motor memory, that is when they learn to walk, um, they just repeat it, they do it over and over again, and that's how they learn to walk and learn to walk in a coordinated, smooth way. Um, this takes longer. Uh, one child was diagnosed with the condition cerebral palsy. Uh, I would just urge you to think about, I think that probably at the end of the day was a misdiagnosis, uh, but a dis rather a descriptive term to be able to describe some of this clumsiness and some of these neurological symptoms, but probably the underlying reason for those symptoms was really CHAMP1 rather than uh, we think of cerebral palsy as being not getting enough oxygen to the brain at birth. Um, I don't know for sure, but probably that it was more the CHAMP1 in that case. Next slide. So uh, the one other thing that I, or one of the other things that I want you to pay attention to is seizures. Um, so the reason for this is because we have seen three of the children with seizures or with epilepsy, then it's real important to recognize that it um, may require an EEG or an electroencephalogram to confirm the diagnosis or to be sure of the diagnosis. Those tests are done by a neurologist where they put um, electrodes attached to the head to be able to see the electrical activity in the brain. The reason I say it's so important is there are medications that can treat this, and if they're not treated, they can really impede or hamper learning for the children. And so um, if you have a sense that your child might be having a seizure, and I'll show you in a second what to look for, um, if you have a phone that can take a video recording of that activity, uh, a good way to be able to capture what's going on and share that with your pediatrician or your neurologist. Seizures can come in many different flavors, and some of them may not be so obvious. So one of them, the first one I listed here, is a febrile seizure. What that means is it's a seizure associated with a fever. Those are not, those may just be one-time events. They may not be permanent epilepsy. It may just be, and we see this even in normal children, that the fever brings it out. But that may not be a recurring problem that needs medication, but still worthwhile to get it checked out. 
a grand mal seizure is something that is associated with movements of the arms and the legs or, or what looks like shivering or um, sort of jerking movements. It can also be associated with movements of the eye or the lips, but the, the point is that you see movement with that. And the grand mal indicates that really the whole body is shaking or convulsing. That one is not hard to, to diagnose. Uh, parents, I think, are very oftentimes aware of this. Um, the time when it's missed when it's missed is because the child is sleeping. And so you, you, know, you just don't see it. The petit mal seizures, the last one that I'm listing here, is one that can easily be missed for a long time. What that looks like is a child staring, um, and it looks like they're just kind of zoned out, and they can be brief um, or petite. Um, and so those can be something that maybe you just weren't watching the child at that exact moment, and so you missed it, or they looked like they were staring off, but they were, you know, it was very brief when it happened, and so you weren't sure that it was a seizure. Again, I urge you if you're seeing these repeatedly, so just one time if you zone out or daydream, that doesn't make a seizure. But if you're seeing this repeatedly or if your teacher at school is seeing this repeatedly, again, I would have a low threshold to have a neurologist do the electroencephalogram. Next slide. So some of the other issues that I know you're very familiar with um, are gastrointestinal issues or tummy troubles. Um, these are things that, again, can be treated medically many times, and so, uh, and we do know that some of the children are taking medication for what we call reflux or heartburn. Um, some of the children have constipation or diarrhea, and even in the same child can alternate between those two. Um, in those cases, sometimes there are dietary adjustments that can be made, but sometimes they need to have some medical, um, some medicines to help sort of get things regular. Um, and those are things that can oftentimes make the children more comfortable as well. There was one child who had needed actual surgery um, for their intestines that were twisted on their self, what we call malrotation. It doesn't look like this is a common problem, um, and it, whether or not this is directly related to the CHAMP-1, I don't think we have enough information to know yet, um, but we have seen one case that required surgery. Um, and then we also had one other case that required a G-tube for feeding. Uh, feeding issues were so difficult that, that they needed a, a tube going directly into the stomach to help get food, get nu good nutrition into the body. Next slide. In addition to that, I would say that there have been minor infections we've seen amongst the children, nothing um, that really we don't see in other children, uh, but we oftentimes, we're hearing that, for instance, ear infections, pneumonia, colds, flu, urinary tract infections. Sometimes the children had um, just, it took longer to get back to normal after an infection. So uh, in terms of being able to take care of this, one of the things is that ear infections, if they seem like they're happening more frequently, and my magic number is three times in one year, um, if there are recurrent ear infections, they can cause problems with hearing. And the problems with hearing are, again, one of the main senses in terms of learning, and in particular, learning to talk. And so important, again, if you're, you're finding that your child is having three infections, three ear infections in a year, um, ear tubes can oftentimes be helpful for that. Uh, with this, immunizations are real important because getting vaccines can help to prevent infections. And so I recommend a flu shot every year. I can't guarantee that it prevents the flu every single year, but it's definitely helpful, not just for the child with CHAMP-1, but actually for everyone in the family. It helps sort of to protect if no one is bringing the flu home, then hopefully it protects everyone from getting the flu. Um, and then in general, we can't pr protect against every single infection, but hand sanitizers, washing hands, um, you know, just staying away from other sick children as much as you can, obviously, can be helpful. Next slide. Um, none of the children have immunodeficiencies. So let me be clear. No one has, to my knowledge, a fundamental sort of catastrophic, life-threatening, infectious problem. Um, the other things I'm going to go over in the next few slides are relatively infrequent. Uh, we did have one child who had some breathing problems to the point that there were brief periods where they had pauses in their breathing, but that doesn't appear to be a, a common issue and may not be related to CHAMP-1. It's not clear yet. Next slide. In terms of endocrine issues or hormonal issues, we did, do have one child who's had problems with being on the shorter side. Again, I think we need more information to see long-term how big an issue this is. Next slide. And in terms of surgeries, 
Uh, we weren't seeing really, I think, surgeries that were very, very common that all the children needed. But as I said, these relate to some of the issues I talked about before. We have had two children who needed ear tubes to help with some of those ear infections. One child who needed eye surgery for the strabismus or the lazy eye I talked about. One child who needed a gastric tube to be able to help with issues in terms of feeding. And then relatively infrequent, but one child who had a broken bone and one child who was tongue-tied um, and also had uh, another child who had the intestinal malrotation. So nothing, not a con clear, consistent picture coming out yet. Next slide. Um, finally, one of the things that I'll say is that scoliosis or curvature of the spine is something that we can see in teenagers that have problems with hypotonia. Um, and many of the children are not yet at that phase of life. But I would urge you when your children do get to be teenagers and going through their growth spurt, that's oftentimes when the scoliosis comes up. So make sure to have your pediatrician check for that. It's very easy to look at the back, look and see if it's straight. Uh, but as your children are getting to be 11, 12, 13, something to start annually checking for at your regular checkup. Next slide. Um, with this, in terms of the medications folks are using, we haven't seen that there's been so far um, things that needed uh, so much treatment that they need medication on a regular basis. The things we have seen are what I was reviewing before. Um, so there is one child that's needed seizure medication, and obviously it's good to do that if, if seizures are a problem. Some of the children who've needed intestinal medication, and parents that have uh, also been trying to figure out what works in terms of diets, vitamins, supplements, um, that's something that many families have been figuring out ways, um, things that might be helpful. Next slide. So uh, I'm going to just summarize here, and, and this will end this part of the segment, and then we can have some questions. Um, overall, what I would say is, again, the children medically, this hasn't really been, I don't think, a big severe burden from a medical point of view in terms of things that required medicines or surgery or ongoing treatment. Um, really, I think the burden in terms of where things have needed ongoing care and support have been more along learning issues. And so this is um, the thing that that I think many of the children in terms of special education, special educators, therapists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, that's been the flavor in terms of what's been really the day-to-day -day support the children have been needing. Um, for many of you, I know it takes, you know, finding just the right educator who can connect with your child or just the right therapist who can bring out the best in them. But really, that's um, critically important in terms of support for your child. Uh, as I said, we haven't seen, at least to date, a de any sort of degenerative issue. I will say that with seizures, until seizures get under control, that can complicate things. Um, so that's one of the reasons, as I said, in terms of making sure that we get seizures, we recognize seizures, and if they're present, making sure we get children on the right medication. So with that, um, that'll end this part of the, the segment. Um, one of the things I, I'm thinking forward to the meeting in Florida, um, to the extent that we can aggregate more information from the families and give you some updates, I'm glad to do that in terms of uh, as more families are diagnosed and registered and get their information in. Um, because as I said, what we're missing a lot of are just numbers, um, and we, we definitely want to help each other out in terms of understanding this, and in particular, older individuals, um, because what I'd like to be able to understand is, are there any particular health conditions that are coming up in adults where we can help make sure we, we put our kids on a road to health, healthfulness and wellness um, as their children and as they're growing up? So let me stop there, and I'm sorry I went a bit long, um, but let me take see if there are any questions. Thanks, Wendy. Um, and for this portion, for everyone on the line, you can feel free to unmute yourself and chime in and ask a question, or if you're uncomfortable doing that, please chat me your questions and I can read them out loud. Hi, could I jump in if that's okay? Sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah, hi, thanks for that. That's been really, really helpful. Um, it's nice to see everything sort of put in one place. Um, it's just like reading a story of my boy from birth, to be honest with you. Um, we're, we're, I've, I've taken sort of a few notes of the things that you've, you've mentioned there. Um, one of the things that I'd quite like to point out is that you mentioned seizures. So seizures isn't something that Callum has ever been diagnosed with, um, but there is something that he does, and it is something within the... Um, 
uh, the group that we've actually mentioned, I've shared a video um, and a few of the, the mums have said, oh, do you know, my, my champ does this. And I've been told from paediatrician that it's a sensory thing, but Callum sort of crosses his legs over and bears down uh, round about like his groin area. And he sort of, he, he really sort of spaces out and it's almost as if he's not in the room when he does that. And I'm um, just listening to what you were saying about the, is it the petit mal um, seizures that you were talking mm -hmm. about there? And mm -hmm. I'm just I'm just wondering um, if that should be something that you think I should be pushing for um, the ECG for to get this sort of looked at in more more detail. Yep. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Does it feel like after this? Well, number one, how long does the episode last? Um, number two, is there anything that seems to provoke it or being associated with it immediately before it happens? And then the third question is, what happens after that's over? Does he feel like his normal self right after? He goes very red um, and he's actually quite warm and it's almost like he's got like a really sort of, he's, he's soaking wet from head to toe. Um, it's it's like he goes into sort of like his own world. Um, he does tend to do it when he's when he's upstairs. He, he'll tend to go up into his room to do it, but he can do it sitting in the living room with you or um, <clears throat> he does get it, 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 I'm not quite sure to be honest with you it can be he sometimes doesn't do it for for a long time and then other times he will start to sort of go through phases of doing it more and more mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and remind me how old he is and when you first started noticing it well, he's 12 years old now, and he's done it since I can, I can, as long as I can remember, to be honest. I think he's he's been probably about uh, one or two when he started to do it. Okay, okay very good. Um, so, and afterwards, it doesn't, it doesn't sound like he's excessively sleepy or tired or out of it. It sounds like it's kind of brief, and then he's back to his normal self afterwards. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's very okay. red-faced, yeah. Okay. Okay. So with this, my sense is that it probably isn't a seizure, but in general for, and this goes for all the families, because it sounds like multiple children have this. Um, the best way of doing this is to get an, to get an EEG, to get the electroencephalogram. Um, the place to do this, they, sometimes neurologists do this as a very brief one, and sometimes they do it as an overnight one. My recommendation would be to do it overnight and do it with what they call a video EEG so that they can actually be recording and seeing what's going on in terms of the behaviors while they're recording the electricity in the brain. And then, um, so this requires admission to a hospital. You'll have to stay overnight to do that. Uh, but then what they have is a little button that you can press so that if you're seeing any of the activities or any of the behaviors that you're worried about, you press the button and then they can go back and correlate when you marked it, when they, what they saw in the video, and what they're seeing electrically. If they can happen to capture one of these episodes on, at the time when they're doing the EEG, then they can be definitive in terms of saying, oh, no, we see the electrical activity is perfectly fine during that. It's nothing to worry about. Or if they say, oh, no, this, clearly there's an electrical storm going on with this. This is a symptom of a, of a seizure disorder. Then they can tell for sure. But at this point, I would say it's better to be on the safe side um, and to get it checked out if it hasn't been already, unless someone in the community has already done this. And we've heard that it was checked out. And, you know, many people sort of they captured this on the video EEG. It wasn't a seizure. We know it's just a behavioral issue. So okay. I, I'd say if if and you guys have probably talked amongst yourselves for that. Um, but if there's been a sort of consensus that it's not a seizure, then that's that's fine and don't worry more about it. If there hasn't been a consensus yet by doing the EEGs, I'd suggest it's worthwhile bringing that up with your doctor. Okay, I, we did we did try to get one done um, during the day, and because I, I mean you can't get them to sit at peace for more than two minutes to be honest, so it was it was sort of inconclusive. Um, so I think uh, yeah, and I think he does have obviously sleep issues, and I often wonder if. The, the screaming that he does in the middle of the night is linked to something else or if it is just mm. part and partial of the champ gene. So, yeah, no, that's fine. I'll follow up with that. That's been really helpful. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. Hi, Wendy. Uh, this is Kadish, JJ's mom. I just had a question about the, about the seizures as well. Um, my son's uh -huh. been doing where it sounds similar to the petite mall seizures. And he's had that like episodes like that since he was a baby. He's almost five. And it's mostly, it's like triggers. It, comes, it goes away for months, and then it happens a lot. And it will be when he hasn't slept for, for a few days. 
and he's had uninterrupted sleep and he's had really um, separation anxiety from me or dad. And then I noticed mm-hmm. that he'll stare off and it's usually in the car. He'll be sitting down eating or just sitting down and he'll stare off. He won't respond to his name. And then I have to literally for like shake him and say his name several times. And then he just kind of like blank stares back. And then sometimes he smirks afterwards, but then he gets very repetitive with sl- wanting to sleep telling me that um, I, I, I don't, I don't go to bed. I don't go to bed. And that's what he, he says. I stay up. I stay up when he doesn't want to go to bed, but that means he's really tired. Um, but we did mm-hmm. overnight EEGs in the hospital. We did an EEG about a couple months ago. It did come back normal, but I, I, I'm just wondering, could the EEG possibly miss that, the petite mal seizures? Yeah. Um, so when you were doing that, did they do a sleep deprivation for him? Because it sounds like, as is often the case, that's a trigger. Would, I know it's kind of cruel to do that, but were they able to do that? No, they just did one where um, they did a couple in the hospital where they let him like normal go to sleep and just monitor him. And then they sent, they one where I went to the hospital, they put it on him and then they sent us home for 24 hours and I went back and gave it back then. Okay. Um, so what I would say is if, if you weren't, and were you seeing anything that looked like one of those zone out episodes when either time when they monitored him? Um, no, I did not, but he, with the, the most recent one, the take home one, his speech therapist notices it too. And his speech uh, therapist said she noticed one of the episodes while he had the EEG on, but it did not take up anything. Okay. Um, so what I'd say is it sounds to me um, like either they just didn't capture it, and I'm not sure with the setup whether or not they looked at the specific time that you or the therapist noticed the time of zoning out, if that's the best way of doing it is being able to, like I say, because 24 hours of data is a lot of data, so it's helpful if they know specifically where to look. Um, what I'd say is if it continues to recur, uh, the thing to do is actually to deprive him of sleep before they do the EEG to try and bring it out. Like I said, I know it's you know a little cruel to do that, um, but that'll give the best chance that they'll see what it is that you're seeing. And if under those circumstances and with you marking and saying you know that this is what I'm seeing, the staring and the zoning out, if they do that and they say electricity is normal at that time, then I'd say you're all clear. Until then, I'm still just a little worried that there might be going something going on that they missed. Does that make sense? Yes, that does. Thank you so much. Do you know if, if it is petite mal seizures, does that make um, an impact on his development, those particular seizures? Well, right, it, it does. Any, any, any seizures, the problem is, is that um, it just makes it difficult for the brain to work when there's kind of this electrical thunderstorm going on in the background. And so there are medications that can help get rid of those, you know, those um, seizures, the vert seizures or the difficult mm. problems with the um, electrical activity. So it, it would help if they're, they are going on. On the other hand, if he's not really having seizures, you don't want to medicate him because those can actually make you drowsy <laughs> and cause their own problems. So it's important to make sure there really are or not seizures before treating treatment. Would, would a child typically lose control of bowel movements and you're like being able to be potty trained? I noticed the last time it looked like he had one was two weeks ago. And for a few days, he kind of regressed with the potty right after. Uh, it won't it won't be like that. Instead, what you would happen as a child who was toilet trained, if they suddenly um, lost it during one of those episodes, it would just happen exactly at that episode, but it won't continue for days afterwards. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello, Wendy. Hello. 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 I think there's hey. two people trying to speak. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, can, I can wanted anybody... to ask a question. Yes, I, I'd sorry, like I... to ask. So I don't know who's who, but the the if the woman can go first, and then what ladies before okay, yeah. gentlemen, if Thank we can you. do that Thank order. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Um, I'm Kerry. I'm Alex. Alex. Is, um, um, we're the only champ family in the, in Wales in the UK, and I've been told that I have a trace of the champ one mutation in me, and I've passed it on to Alex. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as I'm aware, I'm the only one, uh, the only um, case of that. Yes. Okay. Um, and so they they think it was in one of my in my eggs, maybe I don't know. Um, right. That's what the, that's what the geneticist has told me. Okay. So there are. Um, some individuals, and I'm glad you brought this up, there are some individuals where they don't have it in all the cells of their body, and my guess is that may be the case with you. It's just a subset right. of your cells, um, and yeah. in particular in one of your egg cells, and that's how it got passed on to your son. Um, so for you, my guess is that 
you know, you're perfectly fine. There's no problem with any of this, but it, yeah. uh, and I don't know if it's, if you're thinking of having other children, but the chance that you would have another child is a little bit different than what I was talking about for the other families. And we could talk about that, you know, sometime or you could talk to your doctors, but um, just keep that mental note to yourself. Um, well, I'm not having any more children. I've already got a younger okay. daughter and she's, she's absolutely fine. So, um, okay. yeah, it's just that Alex has been affected really. Um, okay. so, um, but I, would that be a, an issue for my younger daughter? Would she need to be tested no. if she chose to have children? Yep. Yeah. So if your younger daughter is fine, um, then she's yeah. not going to have to worry about the champ gene. Uh, you could test her just to make sure I'm not a liar, but I, I can almost guarantee you that she's not going to have it. She won't have to worry okay. about her children. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Very good. And the gentleman. Hi. Um, Hi. I wanted to... Can, can you hear me? I can. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I wanted to go back to the seizure and the crossing of, of the legs a little bit to what Stacy was talking about. One of the things that... Uh, it's, an in, it's interesting you guys bring up seizures. I was always under the impression it was a GI issue that they tend to sort of cross their legs and they're sort of trying, at least for my daughter, she's trying to sort of have a bowel movement. Uh, but I did notice that uh, the, during those periods that she does have uh, sometimes not a uh, nice stagmus in her eyes when she's pushing and she does drift away and look away. And I just didn't know. It's sort of like I'm, cro I'm, 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 I'm going back and forth here and, and uh, just talking today. I'm just kind of a little bit at, at uh, maybe you can, I don't know. I don't know where else to go from this. It's just sort of like we're still trying to learn and find out what's going on. And uh, um, I was pretty much sold that this was a GI issue and this is what she does. And it was a bit of a, uh, um, like a type of sensory position that they put themselves in. It's, it's sort of like what I had, well, convinced myself of. <laughs> So, so I'll say, I think I heard um, one of the mothers say earlier that you guys have taken some videos of this. And um, certainly it's, you know, as I say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, I have some sense of what you all are talking about, but I haven't seen any of the videos yet. And if this is something that, you know, the group the, as a whole wants to drill down deeper into, I'm glad to look over the videos, give you a better sense after I've seen that, um, you know, what might be, if this is more or less worrisome. Uh, it's sounding to me like it could be a behavioral issue. It doesn't have to be seizures, whether or not this is related to constipation, diarrhea, you know, other intestinal issues. You guys um, will know better than I do based on the, you know, sort of the circumstances surrounding these issues. That's what I was asking about before. Is there something that seems to go on before or trigger these issues? Um, but at this point, like I said, I, I don't want to speak out of turn and can, with conjecture that's not founded. So, why don't we follow up with this afterwards? And like I said, if people, uh, I don't know who wants to be the ringleader, Jeff or others in terms of aggregating the frequency of this particular issue, some videos, some thoughts that the families have had, I'm glad to uh, give input on this. I will tell you that you probably realize this, but I'm actually intentionally not on Facebook with you guys. Um, I, you know, I always want you to have a private space to be able to share things and not feel like people are snooping on you or things like that. Uh, but because of that, if you've had a lot of discussion about this on the Facebook page, just so you know, I haven't seen that. And um, so you may have to bring me up to speed. I have a question, Wendy. Sure. Um, Jacob Jensen, uh, we're in Utah. We have Lucas, who is uh, two and a half. My question is, so with the, there, it looks like I didn't realize there were so many differences with the CHAMP1 gene mutation. Um, do you know if that difference could be correlated to why there's such a range in, in functionality of our children or why some children are, um, I guess, why some children are more affected by the CHAMP1 gene than others? Is it because of that differences or is it is there other reasons? Or I, I know you've listed them in that certain order of the stop, but does that affect it at all? So it's a very good question and I can tell you very honestly, we have no idea. Um, so it is possible that it has something to do with the specific CHAMP1 change. It is possible it has to do with other genes uh, that work with CHAMP1 that are different, I'm sure, between each of the children. It's possible that there are differences by age. It's possible that some folks have figured out something that's worked very effectively and 
by luck or by a lot of hard work, they got their kids access to this early on. Um, to be quite frank, right now, we are at the very, very early stages of understanding this. So it comes to the point um, of being able to aggregate data. Um, I do think that there are a lot of, as you said, very unique mutations or very unique genetic differences. Uh, so, and each one is then really, they've got to represent themselves to answer your question. So if everyone were to go all in, in terms of aggregating their data, contributing even, you know, just a relatively small amount of information, I think we could start honing in on that. Um, as a community, this may be part of the discussion you all have in Florida about the research agenda and what you want to do going forward for that. It will be important at some point for those families whose children have unique mutations to make sure their children are represented in terms of cell lines or other things that are necessary for researchers, because if they are unique and the only one with that, there's no one who can sort of do that for them. So, you know, you'll have to make sure your child is yeah. represented in those studies. So it's, a, it's, it's important, yeah, but I don't know is the answer. Do you know, so with the complete loss of function, the children are still producing a partial protein, correct? And the length of that so, is just different, but it's just so, completely off because it's cut off? So that's uh, a hypothesis. It's, um, if I had to guess, and I'm apologizing, but you sound like you have some sort of more technical knowledge, so I'm going to speak a, sort of a little more tech speak. Um, there's a process that's called nonsense mediated decay in which if a transcript for the gene is made that won't encode a full protein, it actually gets erased or it gets degraded. And so it is possible that for all of the families that have one of those stop or loss of function mutations, that they will all result in nonsense mediated decay of one copy of their CHAMP1 gene. And if that were the case, then any of those families that had the star change, they would all act the same from a CHAMP1 point of view. Did that make sense at all? Or it does, yeah. Is there anything okay. that, with the research or anything out there, that could uh, jump that stop and allow it to be read completely? Yes. So the um, so that, in my question theory, is, what is the likelihood besides it, apart from like gene replacement? How can we right. find something so, that would help to do that? Because right. I feel like gene replacement so, still do this out. Right. So people have thought about being able to do what they call read through. Are there medications that could be used to read through that stop and then produce a full length protein? This was done for other diseases, not CHAMP1, um, and has been tried with, I would say, very, very little success so far. Not to say that it won't work, but there, because there are people that are working on that as a sort of common mechanism across genetic diseases. The difficulty, as you can imagine, is that could be promiscuous in terms of not just having an effect on the CHAMP1 gene, but having effect on other genes as well. And so it would be better to have something that were more specific and targeted in terms of being able to deal with that. And one of the challenges that I think we will have in the CHAMP1 community is that it's not quite that everyone is unique, but we, we have to think about a strategy that would work across different changes across the different children. So we can get into it in much more detail, either offline or in Florida, um, but there are some opportunities to, I hope, be able to come to a common mechanism, and to do that would require some um, in vitro studies in which you could literally measure the amount of protein produced from cell lines, figure out if a truncated protein is in fact made. Um, these are all addressable questions, but we just, you know, people have not done those experiments yet. Okay, thank you. That helps. We'll, uh, I guess we'll talk more in Florida or offline. Thank you. Okay, very good. And I have a couple questions that have come through chat, so I'm just going to chime in. Um, um, there's one participant who says that their daughter has been diagnosed with complex partial seizures and also has the GABA2 neurotransmitter that they were told would be the result of the seizures and um, that she's on Keppra and Onfi. Okay, so it sounds like um, I'm guessing this is a participant that wasn't represented in today's presentation, uh, and it, so it sounds like there are also other seizure types, and um, if I'm understanding that correctly, good response to the anti-epileptic medication. So uh, to me, what I take away from that is endorsement that we really we need to continue paying attention to the seizure issue. Great, thank you. Um, and then another question that um, off the topic of seizures is for this mutation, um, their particular mutation is de novo dominant 
and they're asking what therapeutic approaches would you recommend and what are the essential steps to meet um, before starting any therapeutic study? Um, so I'm, I think I understand the question. Um, so I would say there's the short term and the long term. So from a short term point of view, in terms of therapeutic strategies, I think it's treating symptoms. And I think the most important symptoms we've talked about. Um, so that's the short term. That's what you guys are dealing with every single day. To the extent that you can share successes and failures, um, I think those are things that can be disseminated throughout the community, either um, particular educational strategies, uh, medications that seem to work or not work. Um, those are the things to do in the short term. The longer term, uh, again, and maybe this is a session we want to have in Florida or another session as a WebEx, therapeutically thinking about is there a medication that can be developed to treat this? Is there a gene therapy that can be used to treat this? These are all big questions. Um, there are a lot of steps that go into this, and it's more than we have time to talk about today. What I will say is that there are the, the good thing is you're not alone. So even though, you know, CHAMP1 probably feels relatively small and rare, there are um, literally hundreds of other rare genetic disorders that have some overlapping features in some way with CHAMP1. And so there are companies that are thinking about strategies that will work sort of primarily at the gene level, either through gene replacement. So CHAMP1, as we've talked about, let me just give you one example, and this is totally off the cuff, uh, but if CHAMP1 is due to a deficiency of the protein, is there a way to actually replace that, to put that back into cells, to get back up to the normal levels? So that's one strategy that people think about. Um, you may have heard about things like gene editing or fixing the gene. I actually think that's probably a less good option for the community because there are so many different mutations and because there's a difficulty in terms of getting that to work for every single cell that might be necessary in terms of fixing that problem. And we worry about when we talk about gene editing that, that we might accidentally introduce other edits that might be problematic. And so it's hard to do that in a very precise way at this point. Um, but as a general rule, the strategy of somehow, you know, adding back the CHAMP1 that's missing, um, there might be specific medications that would work for the brain in particular. Um, I think that's the route that we're thinking of in terms of this. An important issue to be addressed, and, and I realize this may be complicated, so I apologize, I'm going to do it quickly. But the question um, that I always have in terms of thinking about this is how much of this is a developmental issue that happened in utero even before your children were born. Um, it's going to be hard to turn back the developmental clock if things were fundamentally developmentally determined, but how much of what we see in your children was a developmental issue versus an ongoing maintenance issue. So in other words, maintaining the way the brain's functioning now and will function in the future. Um, there are some experimental ways of approaching that using mouse models, and so that's one thing I would advocate for is an early important experiment to be done for the community to understand and divide out how much of this is developmental versus how much of is neurological maintenance. And then, as I said, a critical, critical issue to me is understanding in adulthood what are the challenges both in terms of development but also medical so that we can try and prepare for those. So I, I hope that gives some insight, but we need to talk more about this and, and it could be an important topic of discussion in Florida. Thank you. And I have one last question that's come through on chat. Um, this is something that you may or may not be able to answer, but they're looking uh, to know if you have any information on uh, why children with the chromosome 13 QTER deletion with a total deletion of one allele seem to have more minor symptoms. Um, and then they said if it is a haploinsufficiency problem. Uh, very good question. Very sophisticated question. Um, so the the issue is is that there are multiple ways to um, take out one copy of the CHAMP1 gene. One is to have a deletion of the chromosomal region that includes CHAMP1, but also with adjacent genes. The general rule of thumb is usually just the opposite. And so I'm. It's you may have you know, sort of picked up something that I was actually ignorant of. But the general rule of thumb is that the more genes, or at least genes that matter, the more genes that you delete within one of those chromosomal regions, the more significant or the more problematic the issues are. As you can imagine, it's just because you've, uh, you have more genes that are affected and more genes affecting more functions of the body. 
Um, what I'd say is in terms of doing this, I'm a, a little reluctant to be able to say for sure that is or isn't the case. I just haven't personally studied it with enough detail to know. But the individuals with deletions, I will warn that there are very frequently differences in size of the deletions. And so it's real important to do um, just a detailed study in terms of careful characterization across the individuals with the chromosome 13 deletion. And then again, uh, being able to get enough individuals at enough different ages with CHAMP1 to make it a really robust comparison. So um, anyway, like I said, glad to talk offline or understand um, the data better because this isn't something that I've you know, looked at carefully myself. Thank you. Um, good morning. I don't... Um, sorry, somebody. No, please go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, well, I just had a kind of, um, a parental challenge that I would like to question. Um, in navigating day to day, how difficult it is with my own two sons, maybe other uh, parents can relate, navigating, um, you know, willfulness versus um, neurological issues. So I kind of have been listening and hearing that, you know, there is some sort of seizure activities or zoning out. Some other parents have talked about. Um, We've talked briefly online, uh, as Dr. Chung, you said you weren't aware of that, but we've talked about, you know, children that do a lot of night terrors or thrashing and screaming at night. Um, for myself, having twins that both kind of do this, um, one more so than the other, when when my boys seem to have an overload mentally during the day, um, whether it is a frustration level that reaches a certain point or... Um, disappointment or whatever they seem to kind of go into an overload and they've always done it they kind of have this um shutdown uh, which is what first led us to think maybe they had some sort of autistic behavior um they just you know you could they would get these um pro provoked by whatever circumstances had them worked up they just would shut down stand still stare up into space repeating the same word, whatever their fixation was, whatever their source of disappointment or frustration, and they would just kind of repeat the same words over and over and over again. Um, and as they've gotten older, they're 10 now, going to be 11, um, they tend to actually lash out more once they get fixated on whatever. It's almost like a mental overload where they get stuck. And I'm wondering, mm -hmm. you know, what if there's a common thread that you guys have seen in any, I know at this point your research and getting to speak with um, individual families and put this all together, it's still small. But if it is a common thread through these kids that they get a process or a, a, a mental overload that kind of prohibits them at times from moving forward, it's like almost full stop. And my challenge within my family has been um, advocating that this is part of their process and, and, and who they are with this CHAMP1 issue um, and not so much a willful or disobedient, it's not, it's not behavioral, although it manifests mm -hmm. in behavior, but because we see them take the stresses to bed at night and almost be living out at night all their daily frustrations. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody else, if, if this is a neurological, I heard you mention neurological storm of sorts that happens with seizures. Mm -hmm. This isn't seizure activity, but mm. it does seem like a storm or an overload on their brains. Right. right. So, it's a, so this is something I actually see quite commonly, um, not just with CHAMP1, but also with other conditions, other uh, genetic neurological conditions. So it is very much sensory overload. And um, I see it very commonly, like I said, where it's just a processing problem. The brain is trying to process a lot of things coming in at the same time, and it's a traffic jam. And it's just too much. And it's very anxiety provoking. Um, you know, people feel like they're really out of control and they're not sure what's going on and what's coming at them. And the easiest thing to do is just to, in some cases, it's shut down, it's withdraw and, you know, get to a safe, quiet space. In some cases, it's just to get quite angry and outlash and, you know, scream and yell or stomp or tantrum in terms of things. Um, and in some cases, like you said, it does come out at night. 
the, the way that I usually deal with this as much as possible is routine, setting expectations, you know, as much as, try, as much as you can, trying to control those situations, prevent those situations with the overload. I know that's just life is life and you can't always do that. Um, but the more you can do that, um, the better it is. And different individuals, depending on what the source of the overload is, have different ways of handling it. Uh, in some cases, you know, there's some physical ways of dealing with things, putting headphones on, um, even compression devices, you know, things that feel like you're getting a big bear hug all the time, um, various different ways to deal with that. But um, wait, wait, it, like, that's, 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 yep. um, well, so then when they, when they are in bed at night and they're supposed to be sleeping, I, I think several of us have discussed the lack of sleep that we've had since we've given birth to our wondrous children um, due to night terrors and thrashing. Is there a course of treatment or someone that we should go to to look at that type of behavior at night so we can kind of calm their anxieties that they seem to be taking to bed? Like, would you recommend any particular type of, I don't know, treatment I, for, for seizures, you know, EEGs, you know, but for night terrors and thrashing, I don't know if sleep studies are the you know, way to look at that right. as well? Or? So again, the community can decide. Um, I'd be interested to hearing from you in Florida what your research priorities are in terms of what things are most um, burdensome, troubling, and then, you know, as we think about that, what things potentially are even treatable. There are some interesting things that, I don't know, this this group might want to embrace that you could do in terms of sleep studies at home. I think sleep studies in the hospital, quite honestly, are not that helpful because it's not natural sleep and it's not what the real world is like. But there are things you can do. Even um, there's a monitor you can put, in a, it's basically an electrical monitor you can do to monitor sleep by putting it under the mattress and being able to get a sense of you know, when are, when are the problems happening? How severe are they? How consistent are they? Um, but at least collecting data to be able to know this. Maybe you guys already know this and you don't need to, um, but it's helpful then to have a baseline so that as you then try an intervention, a medication, something else that you do, be able to monitor progress and see very quantitatively and objectively whether or not it's getting better or not. Um, and if the community agrees that sleep is like your number one priority, then, you know, we can have a focused discussion on sleep. And it may not be, you know, I myself who's the only expert in this, but there are various sleep experts that I know of that we could bring to bear in this and, you know, start really, um, you know, understanding this better and more importantly, coming up with some possible treatments and, and seeing how effective they are. Um, but like I said, this is early days, so I'm really glad to hear from the community, you know, what the major issues are and, and then let's take the time to delve into them. Thank you so much. Um, and lastly, will you reach out to the families that you were mentioning? I, I, I don't know how anybody knows what specific um, variation their kids have because my report was very well above my head. So if you were interested in um, the set of kids that had the non asterisk, um, would they be yes. notified that you found it important that they attend? Because like, for instance, we're not um, attending at this point. It's, it's too far for us. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad to, and, and just to be clear, you know, I, I, I actually, Jeff, I hadn't asked you with this. I assume that we're either recording and or streaming the meeting. So if people can't attend in person, there should be ways of doing this. For those who live in the United States, uh, if you wanted to donate a blood sample but aren't able to attend, uh, there are ways of doing that. Jeff may have set up something even for families outside of the United States. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, don't feel guilty or if it's difficult or for whatever reason you can't will bring the community together in one way or another. Um, but uh, mainly I'm, I'm just thinking about what are the things we should spend the time talking about because we'll have more time at that point. Thank you so much. And, and to answer your question, um, if it's helpful, yes, I'm glad to reach back to the folks who had the last uh, non-truncating mutation, just so you're aware of who you are. Appreciate you being here, thank you. Okay. Okay. So. Um, I know we're a little bit over time and I want to be conscientious of Dr. Chong and everyone else's time. So I have a couple more questions that have come in on chat and then um, once those are answered, we'll go ahead and end the meeting. Um, and just after the meeting ends, just remember, we're going to keep the line open for families so you all will still have some time to discuss the summer meeting, research priorities, any more connecting you want to do. Um, and with that, Dr. Chong, um, one of the questions that came through is uh, someone was wondering what the difference between a duplication and a deletion in the coding of the DNA was and what does that mean? 
Okay. Um, so in terms of deletion and duplication at the level I think you're talking about, it really doesn't make a difference. Um, so sometimes people have a deletion or they, they're missing a few of the letters, the alphabet letters. Sometimes they have a duplication and they have a few extra of the alphabet letters. If that's what we mean by deletion and duplication, at the end of the day, it really doesn't make a difference except to say that they both disrupt the CHAMP1 gene. Um, and I think that's the level that you're talking about. If it's something different, let me know afterwards, but I think that's what your question is, is really about. Right, thank you. And then the final question um, may kind of go back to your comment about numbers, but they're asking just about a natural or a medicinal supplement that might help kids with CHAMP1 mutations. Right. So at this point, there hasn't been anything that's come across, again, for the families who've been part of Simon's VIP that I've seen, you know, either reports or we've heard through the genetic counselors about things that were very clear winners in terms of this. But one of the priorities that I have, and maybe you guys have already figured this out in terms of how you shared information, however you structure this, I do think it's important to do um, the things that are clearly benefiting as well as the things that are clearly not working. So however it is you're aggregating, collecting your data, um, those are the near-term things that should work. I have not heard of anything particular, a particular diet, a particular supplement that's been extraordinarily effective. But again, um, I, I haven't heard from everyone. So it's possible someone has either stumbled upon this or, or found this out on their own. Okay, thank you so much, 